today's date is July 14th, 2021, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's hearing is completely remote. We are using a Zoom video conferencing meeting platform today. So for you at home who are viewing the hearing or may wish to participate in the hearing, I wanted to take a moment to explain the technological pieces of the remote hearing. And we also have a slide up that should be providing some information as well. So to participate in today's hearing, you may connect with us via the Zoom link, which is posted on the planning department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, you may participate in today's meeting by phone. Please dial 1-669-900-9833 or 6833, excuse me. And when prompted, enter collaboration code number 836-8856-4623. If you wish to simply view today me today's meeting, it is being broadcast live on television. And for more information, please visit Community Television's website. A couple of instructions about participating in today's meeting. For each agendized public hearing item, Time will be provided for speakers to contribute their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants, participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone by remotely raising their hand by pressing star nine on your telephone. I will call on participants by either your name or by the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll be you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on your telephone. Members of the public will be provided three minutes to speak on agendized items. If at any time you have difficulty connecting to, to today's meeting via the Zoom link or calling in via telephone, Please email our support staff, Michael Lamb at michael.lamb, that's L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. He will be checking his email periodically throughout the meeting, and he's on standby to assist you if you have any questions. All right, it appears we are situated. I will now turn it over to the Planning Commission Chair, Judith Lazenby. Good morning, Judith. Good morning, and thank you. And the uh, good morning to all of the participants and welcome to this July 14th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Planning Commission. The time is now 9.33 and I'm going to call the meeting to order. Can you all hear me? Yes, yeah. we can, Chair. Oh, thank you. Um, it's 9.33 and I'm calling this meeting to order. May we please have a roll call, Ms. Drake? Yes. All right, we'll call Commissioner Schaefer Freitas. Here. Commissioner Shepard. Commissioner Shepard, you may be muted. I, I thought she had her alternate. She's on here. Let's see. Uh, Commissioner Shepard, can you hear us? And she's off. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I had to uh, relaunch the meeting for some reason, but I'm here now. No problem. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Sheridan. I'm here. And Commissioner Holbert. Commissioner Holbert, you may be muted. Here. Oh. Good morning. And then Chair Judy Lazenby. Here. Good morning. All right. Thank you. 
moving on down the agenda, are there any additions, changes, or correction to today's agenda? Uh, no, there are not, Chair. Well, having none, then may I have a motion to approve the entire agenda, including the consent agenda? I'll move with, uh, I'll make that motion. Why are, I mean, I'm a little confused. This is different than how we usually do it. Um, we well, move on to number three and number four. I, I, I don't understand why we're approving the whole agenda, right? Or the consent agenda in three and four at the same time. Well, because we have not had a, a consent agenda item since we started making the approval of minutes part of the regularly scheduled agenda. So this, because we do have a consent agenda item, then I'm asking for a motion to approve the agenda so it will take care of that item. So right. when, you, when you say approve agenda, what item numbers do you mean? If you can clarify that, please. Okay, that would be all the items from um, from the beginning down through item number eight. This is just approval of the order that these things are listed and will be entertained. Okay, and then we'll come back to each individual item after we approve. Well, we won't order. come back to we won't come back to the consent item because um, unless I hear a motion that 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 be pulled off and heard as the regularly scheduled items. Okay, so we won't right. open up the consent again, but we will go back to then. Um, item number six. Well, what happens to items number three and four? No, no we we will go back to three and four. We will but go this back. will just right. Okay. Okay, I I just don't remember doing it in this order before, but well, we have that, not had any item on the consent agenda for about five years, I think. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so maybe it's more than my memory that's not working. Okay. Well, you know, it it doesn't really matter if you if it's cleaner and easier for other members, we can approve the consent agenda and then move on, like we always have. I don't think it makes much difference. Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make that motion. A second. second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Then um, are there any declarations of ex parte communications? <clears throat> no. Hearing none, then I will move on to the oral communications. And this is the time when the commission will hear brief statements from members of the public who wish to speak regarding issues that are not on today's agenda. And you will have two minutes, each one of you. Are there any participants online? Um, yes, Chair, I'm seeing a uh, hand raised by Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebanks. So um, we will hear from them. Good morning, Michael and Jean. Will you please state your name for the record in case I misstated your name? You have two minutes. Hi, um, this is Jean Brocklebanks speaking now. We are two individuals who are sharing the same computer. So we hope that as we go through the planning commission meeting, we will be able to each speak individually. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm asking that of the chair now just to alert you. Secondly, um, I was confused by the way you began the meeting because generally uh, you follow the uh, agenda, which I had studied, and you go, you do number one first, and then you do number two, and then you do number three, and then you do number four, and then you get to number five, which was the consent agenda. So that was very confusing to me. And also uh, members of the public are generally asked 
if they want to speak about any consent agenda item. And so that didn't happen either. Um, and I think that's all that I have to say, except did I hear you say that when it comes to an agenda item, uh, on the regular agenda that we will only have two minutes three. or we will have three minutes to speak. I just wanted to confirm that for the uh, agenda items that we will have three minutes to speak. In the, in the public hearing, yes, you're okay. absolutely correct. Okay, all right. So thank you very much. It's good to be here at this meeting and it's good to see um, the, the, be able to see the faces of the various commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay, we have another caller today uh, by the last four digits, 2915. Good morning, please state your name for the record. Yeah, you have two minutes. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Becky. Thank you, good morning. Um, I am not sure I will be able to stay uh, to listen to item number seven. I have. A medical appointment this morning. If I speak now and I'm able to stay, would I be precluded from speaking about it again during the scheduled agenda time? Well, you wouldn't be precluded, but we, in any time that you speak during this particular part of the program, the uh, we don't have any discussion of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if I am able to stay, I could testify again um, yes. on item number seven. Mm -hmm. Correct. Oh, that's great. That's not how it works at the Board of Supervisor meeting. So I'm glad that you allow um, ample public comment. Um, I am concerned. Um, well, first of all, just let me say that I am, I am watching the, on a different topic, the local hazard mitigation plan that is now open for public comment and comments close on July 23rd. I'm wondering if there will be any kind of a public hearing uh, or meeting about that to go over that very extensive document as it is in form uh, going for approval. Um, I haven't seen anything like that. I have many concerns about the wildfire component of that hazard mitigation plan. And then to speak to item number seven, in case I'm not able to stay, I'm very opposed to this project. I think this will cause great harm to the Simkin Swim Center users and the traffic and the quality of uh, what goes on there in terms of focus on the swim center. The, the construction itself of this Live Oak Annex which they're calling a library and using Measure S funding for is not is not a, a library. It's, I, I mean, I read in some of the Board of Supervisors materials, there may not even be a librarian staff on, on duty there, um, yet Measure S money is being used to fund it. There would be a total of 990 truckloads of cut and fill that would take uh, to construct this this annex right um, on the, the property and connected to the the parks department building and the swim center. That's, That's a two lot minutes. of truck. <coughs> Thank you, Becky. Is that it? That's okay. the two minutes for public comment. Okay. Uh, and finally, if I'm not able to stay, um, I oppose that there will be Ms. Steinbrunner, I, I think you were referring to item number eight on the agenda. That's correct, Chair. Okay. okay. Um, let's see, if there are any other members of the, of the public who wish to speak on an item not on today's agenda, please make yourself known by raising your hand. And I am not seeing any additional callers, Chair. Okay, thank you. And we will go on to the 
regularly scheduled items since we have approved all the other items, and especially the one on the consent. The um, item number six is the minutes. I'll move approval of the minutes of May 26th. Is there a second? I believe I have to abstain from that. Right. That's correct. Commissioner Schaefer Freitas. I made the motion. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? I'm not, um, Denise Holbert not voting. Okay, there would be two abstentions then. Commissioner Sheridan and Holbert. Correct, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, then we move on to item number seven, renewal of the partners in restoration. Okay, let me promote, uh, we need to promote Juliet Robinson making the presentation today. Walter, will you please promote Juliet Robinson? I'm not, it doesn't appear that I'm able to. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, Juliet. Good morning, Jocelyn. Good morning. Good morning. Do you have any additional um, members of your team who we should be promoting to speak today? Matt Johnston and I think, I believe, Kelly Camara should be on the line as well. Okay. From, from the Resource Conservation District. I see them both, thank you. And it looks like they've both been promoted. Thank you very much. And I also have a brief slideshow that um, I sent over. Great. Walter, you can go ahead and bring up the slideshow for item number seven. Thank you. Okay, are we ready? We are ready. Great. Um, thanks, Jocelyn. Good morning, commissioners, Chair Lazenby. Um, I am here today to present the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County's request for an extension of their existing master permit for environmental enhancement projects. Next slide, please. The master permit is a programmatic type permit that has been in place now for about 16 years. It covers a number of different county approvals as applicable for certain types of projects that qualify under the program, including a coastal development permit, riparian exception, grading permit, biotic approvals, and encroachment permit. Next slide, please. The master permit was originally approved by the Planning Commission in 2005 and has been granted a number of extensions since that time uh, by both the Planning Department and the Planning Commission. These extensions have occurred approximately every five years um, and some minor changes and additions were made to the permit in 2011. Today's request is for a five-year extension to the permit with some minor amendments to the practices covered by the permit. Next slide, please. Uh, the master permit is part of the countywide partners and restoration permit coordination program, which is implemented by the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County or RCD. This program partners local, state and federal agencies with the purpose of helping private landowners on a voluntary basis who are interested in correcting problems on their properties like erosion and degradation to sensitive habitats but are often discouraged from undertaking such projects because regulatory permitting can be very complex, time consuming and cost prohibitive. So this program helps streamline that permitting process. 
um, property owners are faced with a number of issues that can be streamlined by this program. And I've included a few examples here of some of the more common problems. Next slide, please. Um, unpaved rural access roads that have poorly designed or maintained drainage infrastructure are common throughout the county. And um, while these roads may look fine in the dry weather, when it rains, um, not only does it create access issues, but all of this sediment ends up in our streams and waterways. Next slide, please. Another common problem is native habitats being overtaken by invasive species that can outcompete native plants and degrade natural habitats. Next slide. Uh, Man-made dams and other structures that create barriers to migration of endangered fish species are also much too common throughout our county streams, um, often on private properties. And removal of these types of barriers can be some of the more complicated projects to complete because of the presence of endangered species and the many regulatory agencies that become involved when working in a stream like this. Next slide, please. Under the Partners in Restoration Program, the Resource Conservation District coordinates with uh, these other agencies who are partners in the program, um, and it helps streamline the permitting process. So landowners deal solely with the RCD, who then is responsible for ensuring that all the county, state, um, and federal requirements are being met. Uh, the master permit authorizes 15 different types of projects. All are intended to create, restore, or enhance natural habitat and or protect water quality. Uh, eligible projects are subject to certain size limitations and other parameters and conditions that are built directly into the permit. And overall, each project must demonstrate a net benefit to the environment. I've included a few examples here on the following slides of uh, some of the types of projects that are commonly or commonly have been covered under the permit in the last 16 years. Next slide, please. Uh, sometimes something as simple as improvements to the slope and drainage infrastructure on these existing access roads can greatly help reduce or eliminate erosion and sediment that would otherwise end up in our streams. Next slide. Uh, implementation of fish habitat enhancement projects, including the removal or modification of barriers to fish passage, can sometimes open up many, many miles of stream um, habitat for endangered fish. So while the footprint of these types of projects and the impacts may be small, um, the net environmental benefit can be huge. Next slide. Obstruction removal includes the removal and disposal of unwanted structures from waterways and sensitive habitats. Next slide. Removal of exotic plants and replanting uh, with native vegetation can restore rare declining sensitive habitats and improve habitat for the species that live within them. Next slide. Insulation of sediment basins can help stabilize downstream channel flows and reduce sedimentary runoff. Next slide. Stream bank protection is the practice of using vegetation or structures to stabilize slopes, and this helps prevent further erosion and future sedimentation. Next slide, please. Wetland management was one of the practices added to the program in 2011, and uh, this practice has been utilized to restore or enhance wetland conditions at 10 different sites since that time. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the Partners in Restoration program has shown continued success throughout the 16 years since its conception. And there have been no significant violations or other problems with the master permit since its original approval in 2005. So since that time, the master permit has facilitated 116 environmental enhancement projects across the county. Approximately 40 miles of salmonid habitat have been improved with the program. Around 40,000 tons of sediment have been captured and prevented from entering our waterways. And approximately 200 acres of upland, wetland, and riparian habitat have been in store, uh, restored. Next slide. Uh, this is a map that's just showing the distribution of projects that have been completed under the program uh, countywide since 2005. Next slide, please. So at this point, the program has been successfully underway for, like I said, approximately 16 years. And the RCD, county planning, and other participating ag agencies 
have really been able to hone in on what works and what can be fine-tuned to strengthen and improve the program. Uh, so some minor changes to the permit are being proposed for this extension, uh, and all of which are intended to either refine permit efficiency or improve resource protection and enhancement. Uh, new terms are also being proposed regarding the level of approval required for these permit extensions moving forward. The proposed master permit would allow future extensions to occur every five years at a level three approval by the planning department. And so these extensions would only come before your commission for approval if any major amendments or revisions were proposed that require additional CEQA review and analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, for CEQA, uh, a mitigated negative declaration was adopted by the Planning Commission in 2005 for the original master permit. Uh, the currently proposed changes to the permit and program itself have been reviewed and involve minor technical changes that do not change the CEQA determination and would not require additional environmental review or revisions to the mitigated negative declaration. So we prepared an addendum to the 2005 MND, which was included in your packet for review. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the original CEQA determination for the master permit is still valid, and with mitigation, there will be no significant impacts associated with the program or the minor amendments being proposed. Uh, this extension of the master permit would allow for a continuation of a successful program that partners local, state, and federal agencies to help private landowners complete much needed environmental enhancement projects across the county. So staff recommends that your commission approves this five-year extension of the master permit with minor amendments and approves the addendum to the 2005 mitigated negative declaration. Next slide. And uh, myself, Matt Johnston, the environmental coordinator, and I believe Kelly Camara with the Resource Conservation District are all here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions by the commissioners? I have a question. I, I, came, I came to the meeting with information as of yesterday, and I'm wondering if you could list the minor exceptions that are being part of this approval. The changes to the permit? Yes. Um, the... There are several changes to the uh, size restrictions. Um, so most of the most of the changes, there's a, a minor change made to the wetlands management, which was added in 2011. And so they've really been sort of fine tuning what works and what doesn't work. Um, so they've increased um, both the, uh, or asked for increases in both the cubic yards of grading that's allowed and also the area of grading. Um, uh, there's also some increases to the linear feet of stream habitat improvements, so dewatering, uh, linear feet of dewatering has increased some, and that's mostly to match the other regulatory agencies. So no fisheries has a, a thousand linear feet area of dewatering um, that's allowed. Uh, we've changed some minor language to the revegetation portions of the permit that um, because in the last 15 years, we have a much better understanding of what works for restoration and what doesn't. Um, some minor language changes to allow for um, better improvements to monarch habitat in case that species becomes um, officially listed in the next few years. Uh, there's an increase in the width of in-stream dam removals by 10 feet. Um, so uh, a, a bit of a larger width of dams can be removed for fish passage. Um, and then Kelly, you may, there may be some additional changes. Um, I think most of the, there were some minor administrative corrections and changes to reporting procedures. So um, rather than having a full end of year report, we're gonna do more of a table format um, because it's easier to review and easier to prepare. I think that covers most of the changes. Thank you. Any other commissioners have questions? Uh, I just like to make a comment. 
Okay. I think this is a great program. I've seen some of the results and it makes it easy and possible to do some really important stuff. So it's really nice to get the report. I haven't seen a summary of all that's been going on. So I found the report really interesting and I'm really glad we have this. And a great report too, by the way, it was clear and understandable and um, really insightful. Um, Chair Lazenby? Yes. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Shepard. It was a very interesting report. I, I wasn't aware of the uh, depth of the, of the programs. I just had a brief question about the mechanics of financing this. Most of the clients are private property owners, I would imagine. Is that true? Yes. Yes, they all are. Okay. And so then is it done on a, on a cost basis? Um, Kelly can probably speak more to the financing of the actual projects. My understanding is that there are some tax tax funds that are available and then also um, grant funding that the RCD um, looks for. The county is not, not part of the funding for the projects. Uh, Kelly, do you want to speak to how the funding for these projects works? Sure. Good morning, commissioners. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present this morning and for your continued support of the program. Um, our, our clients come to us on a voluntary basis. The Resource Conservation District works in a non-regulatory, non-enforcement. Um, and our mission is to help private landowners restore natural resources. The funding sources for permit coordination are multiple. Like Juliet mentioned, we do have a small tax base from the county, uh, but predominantly our funding comes through grant writing. Mm -hmm. uh, so our funds for implementation, designs, and completing all the documentation for permits is either or predominantly through individual grants or through fee-for-service agreements through private landowners when we don't have grant funding available. Do you ever have a situation where the client, where there's not grant funding available and the client can't afford to pay the cost base of service? Um, we always have to prioritize resources within the community. If it is a high priority project and we don't currently have funding for that type of project or one of our programs, we will seek funding for that individual landowner. Okay. Uh, we do request some kind of in-kind, if not cash contribution from the landowners. We've just found that there's a lot more buy-in um, and commitment to long-term maintenance of the project. Um, when they're either involved through um, ongoing maintenance, maybe they do the revegetation themselves or a small co uh, cash contribution, it mm -hmm. tends to lead to longer term buy-in and, and management. Right, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. And will we hear from Mr. Johnston? I believe he's available yeah. for questions. <laughs> I am available for questions, but I think Juliet and Kelly uh, have <laughs> fully represented and have all the facts that you need. Okay, does that, uh, does that end your presentation? That's all I have for now, unless you have more questions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what's okay. our official action on this? Oh. You should be open. This would here. be for. Yes, I, I was just getting ready to do that. Okay. I will now open the public hearing and all of the ones of the participants online. Uh, Ms. Drake, are you still with us? I am. Yes. And so uh, this is the, uh, the chair has opened the public hearing for this item, which is um, item number seven on the agenda. And I just wanted to remind anyone who may be calling in with a comment that to make yourself known that you wish to make a comment, you would press star nine on your telephone to remotely raise your hand. <clears throat> and so let me see if I see anyone here. Um, And uh, Chair, I'm not seeing any callers for this item at this time. Okay, I, I show there are 34 participants. Is that online? 
on the phone. Um, I'm seeing, uh, I am seeing a number of attendees, but I'm not seeing anyone raising their hand to speak on this item. Okay. If there, yes. Mm -hmm. If there are no um, participants that want to address this issue, then I'll bring it back to the commissioners <laughs> for discussion. Well, I'd like to um, move approval mm -hmm. of the renewal. What's the language I need here? <laughs> okay. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Any discussion? And then I think, I think what Commissioner Shepherd is referring to is that she's moving the staff recommendations. Thank you. Um, on page five of the report to adopt the addendum to the mitigated negative deck and approve the application number two one one. 073 based on the findings and conditions attached to the staff report. Thank you. That, that's indeed what I would like to. The motion contains exactly that language. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I seconded it already. So I think we're ready to vote. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposition? Thank you. So then this has been approved, 211073. It's a great Thank you, program. We'll move. I just want to say it's a great program, and I think you should get more publicity. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, commissioners. <laughs> So that brings us to item number eight, the proposal to construct a library annex it's at Simpkins Swim Center. Okay, and so Walter, um, we would need to promote Randall Adams. He's presenting on this item today. And please also promote Damon Adlau. Thank you. And we can go ahead and load the PowerPoint for item number eight. Good morning, Randall. Hmm. It appears you're muted, Randall. Sorry about that. Good morning, uh, Good Randall morning. Adams, the County Planning Department. Uh, I'd like to begin by stating that uh, we did receive an item of correspondence early this morning um, from a member of the, the public opposed to this project. That was an email forwarded to support staff. Um, and then you also had an opportunity to hear during oral comments uh, from Becky Steinbrenner. Hopefully she'll also have an opportunity to speak on this item during uh, public comment. Um, as noted in the agenda, this is a proposal to construct a library annex at the Simpkins Swim Center. And if we could go to the next slide. The, the project is located to the west of 17th Avenue behind Shoreline Middle School and adjacent to the upper portion of Schwan Lake, of the uh, trails above Schwan Lake in the Live Oak planning area. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, the zoning for this site is PR, which is Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. Go to the next slide, please. And the general plan land use designation for the site is O-R, which is uh, consistent with the zoning. It is parks, recreation, and open space. Uh, the site is currently improved with the Simpkins Swim Center, which includes the Live Oak Community Center and administrative offices for parks and recreation staff. Um, 
Yes, thank you for showing the slide photographs. Um, we can go through those. We go back to the, that's fine. Um, these are some photos that are showing the site as it currently exists and including the front entry to the, to the, the Simpkins Swim Center, which is the area where the annex is proposed. Uh, the traffic circle there with the oak tree, the tree would be retained. The traffic circle is proposed to be removed. Next slide. These are these are existing shots of the these are shots of the existing front entry showing how the swim center is currently accessed. Uh, the the proposed annex would be to the left of this in the in the in the photos. Go to the next slide, please. This is a site overview, and this shows uh, that the project would occur in two phases. The first phase being the most substantial. It would be um, on the front of the property, including the traffic circle, um, the annex addition and a new pedestrian plaza, with the second phase occurring later um, at the rear of the building, which would include a childcare facility and some landscaping improvements. Next slide, slide please. This here shows on the site plan, the, the total new footprint of building area. As you can see in red, approximately 2000 square feet of new area is proposed at the front of the building. And then in the second phase, approximately 550 square foot addition of building for a child care uh, area uh, facility would, would be proposed. Next slide, please. This, um, the, the, the lower elevation, the, the upper elevation is the existing front elevation along the building. It is, it's, this would be looking kind of along the whole driveway of the parking lot area across the building. The lower slide is, is difficult to read because of the line weight, but the primary purpose of this slide is to show that the, the existing addition would be on the left portion of that, of that image, and it is no higher than the existing building. Next slide, please. These are more detailed elevations of the proposal. The, um, the proposed 2,000 square foot addition would also have adjacent to it a covered area uh, with seating, which would be adjacent to the entrance into the pool facilities. Next slide, please. And this is a better visual rendering of that. This shows how there would be an, an awning the library annex on the left side of that proposed addition, and then the, the open area that is covered, um, which would be an area adjacent to the pedestrian plaza. So this would allow more outdoor activities and so forth to occur with this facility. Next slide, please. And this shows how the landscape improvements would change. The traffic circle that had pre that is currently there is shown in the upper portion of this slide with the oak tree in the middle, which will be retained, and then showing how the pedestrian plaza would would be configured around the proposed addition. The, the total new floor area for the proposed library annex would be approximately 2,000 square feet as noted in the first phase. The second phase would include approximately 550 square feet at the rear of the building in the second phase. The design of the proposed additions would be consistent with the architectural style of the existing building, and the project would be compatible with the surrounding pattern of development, including the adjacent Boys and Girls Club and the Shoreline Middle School. Landscaping and paving improvements would also be included in each phase with the circular driveway at the front of the facility being replaced with the new pedestrian plaza indicated in this image and the entry to the combined facilities for the annex, the, the, the swim center and the administrative offices for parks uh, and recreation. Adequate shared parking would remain available for the combined uses as indicated in the traffic study prepared for the project, which is also included under exhibit G of the staff report starting on page 53. As proposed in condition, the project is consistent with the county code, the general plan, and the local coastal program. Staff recommends that your commission accept the determination that this project is exempt from further review under the California Environmental Quality Act and that you approve application 201354. That concludes the staff presentation and we are available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions by the commissioners? Yeah, I've got questions. Okay, Commissioner Sheridan. Um, I have several members of my family that have physical disabilities, and I also have a young grandson. And I can't sometimes I have they have to stay in the car. And libraries often need a way to drop off a book or um, approach the building and check out a book. And I was surprised that all the, uh, the handicap access 
all of the parking was removed from the front of the building. And I'm concerned about that uh, because you can't put a child out of the car, go inside. If you just want to drop off a book, it's too, maybe too far away. So that was question number one. Question number two. Mr. Adams, were you going to respond to the? I, oh. I thought there were more questions coming, but right. definitely I, I can respond to that. Certainly, okay. the the, pl the plans indicate that the existing accessible parking will not be modified, which is adjacent to the the entry to the swim center now, which is actually if you were looking at the building to the right of that, and that on the plans will will remain the same. Okay. Um, I would defer to the project architects with Nolan Tam and the project manager um, as to how decisions were made about the library annex and the ability to drop off books at that location. But there will continue to be a, a vehicle drop off for, for individuals to be dropped off at the front of the pedestrian plaza. So in terms of accessible parking, I don't believe there is any change proposed to the actual designated accessible spaces as shown on the plans. Okay, thank you. And uh, on the lighting, um, just so you're recommending to to that that would be a question for the architects. For uh, for the accessible parking. No, for environmental impact for birds, for example. Oh, I didn't hear a question about lighting. I think there, that that the volume may have cut out on that question. I think that's that's correct. Would you mind restating that question, um, Commissioner Sheridan? I think you you cut out for a moment while you were asking the second question. Okay, thanks. So what I'm concerned about is that any additional lighting would not be um, would would not be having any impact on wildlife. So we're not increasing any lighting, and that it's um, progressive in thinking about. Um, the fact that there's a huge bird uh, rookery and bird habitat next door that would be affected by increasing any lighting. I'm not aware of any increase in lighting beyond what is there other than perhaps uh, just replacement of lighting along the front of the building and under the canopy area. Um, I would defer to the, the architectural team if there are proposing any brighter lights or lights that are not directed downward, uh, keeping all glare on the site. Okay. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, if I may, um, I'm Dave Madlow. I'm a project manager with the uh, Department of Public Works, and I would likely answer that question. So the new lighting will be consistent um, with what's there currently. Um, the, yeah, the intent is definitely to have all lighting to be downlit, and um, it shouldn't be anything more than what's currently there. Um, I believe the Nolan Tam team, the architecture team may be on the line, Leah Martinson, she can be promoted to maybe respond to this question. Yes, uh, Walter, will you please promote Leah Martinson? I see her hand is raised as well. Thanks, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. Repeat the names, please. Uh, Leah Martinson, she has her hands, her hand raised. She's an attendee, will you please promote her? The panelists, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Leah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, yes, I can confirm what Damon said that all of the lighting is um, dark sky compatible. So they're all down lighting. And um, the plaza is really replacing that existing traffic circle, which had pretty tall. Um, parking lot lights and we're replacing it with fewer parking lot lights and low level bollard lights just to maintain you know safe lighting levels through the plaza at nighttime so it's not increasing the light levels of the project changing but not increasing that's good to hear do you want a, a further question elaboration on that or does that answer your question that answered my question. Thank you. That sounds better than what's there, actually. It's going to be beautiful. I know I'm not supposed to say that right now. So the, the representatives from Noel and Tam 
are available for further questions then. Ms. Marthiesen. Yeah, I'm the representative for Nolan Tam. So yes, we are available. I'm happy to answer anything else. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Um, I, uh, Chairperson Lazenby, if I may. Um, yes. I had a question. So they, this is called a library annex and its use is going to be what again? Could somebody describe that please? Yeah, if, yeah, if I may, I could uh, describe the use. So primarily um, the use of the space is to accommodate library programs um, for uh, Santa Cruz Public Library System, but specifically the Live Oak branch, which doesn't have the space. Um, it's a roughly a 12,000 square foot building, but they don't have the um, um, small conference rooms, the group study rooms, and the tutoring center, um, which is which are just a few of the planned programs um, for the annex itself. So a lot of it, I guess, for lack of a better term, is maybe a little bit of overflow for the um, Live Oak branch to, to have their library programs and a place to do it. In addition, one of the, the things that uh, this site was identified um, for those programs, because it also, um, the, the adjacencies with the Simpkins Swim Center, the Boys and Girls Club, Shoreline Middle School, and then developing kind of a sense of place for Live Oak, we thought this was an ideal place for that. Uh, I also wanna add that the plaza, while it's not additional, um, building space, it also is being designed to accommodate programs. And a lot of these, the, pro, the outdoor programs have yet to be decided, but there's talks of, you know, if it's food trucks or potential type arts and crafts types, uh, type areas, and it's really gonna kind of humanize that space a little bit more in my opinion. So um, we just felt like this was an ideal place for that. But to answer your question in short, it's primarily for library programs. Okay, and then the child care center, which is a second stage improvement um that would be um a publicly run child care center or private yes, or that was probably invited I'm, I'm sorry um for interrupting but uh, to answer your question the, it would be run by the parks department um and some of the programs there's currently an MO, mou being worked on by the two by the library and the parks directors um to share the spaces um but Getting back to the child care area, currently the discussion is that it would be run by Parks Department. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from commissioners? I have another question. Okay, Commissioner Sheridan. Thank you. Um, is this going to be a library housing books or is this going to be a facility for? Um, meeting rooms. I'm, I'm confused about what the whole purpose was. Yeah, I, the there will be the opportunity for holds, and I think that's maybe Leah, and I'm not sure if there's anybody on from the library to talk specific programs. Um, there, there will not necessarily be stacks of books per se, but there will be a place and opportunity to, to have holds, and you could um, um, basically through your system, through your account, um, ask that the, uh, the books that you're reserving are held at this space. Um, but the, the actual spaces themselves, again, are for library programs, um, um, some of the reading programs, literacy programs that they have there, as well as opportunities for, um, for for kid group study and and similar things. But as far as it's, we're trying to, it's sort of rethinking, um, and a lot of the pro, uh, projects that I'm working on for the library, it's rethinking what a library is. A lot of times the term uh, 21st century library, which is the in general, the model is to remove uh, some of the books from the space. So obviously make them accessible via um, uh, the reserve system, but create spaces for community, spaces for group study. Um, again, it's, that's kind of the focus in a lot of the, the builds of these uh, new buildings. So um, yeah, hopefully I've answered your question. Maybe Leah, you could add anything and I'm not sure if, if there's a library staff here and would like to, to comment on the, the program specifically, if you could raise your hand. 
he had if he had anything else to add to that maybe yeah, I mean, I think Damon probably can, and the library can speak to the specifics of the programs, but um, you're correct that there is no permanent book storage currently planned in the annex space. What, what is being planned for is um, automated book lockers and hold space so that people could pick up and drop off books in that case, and then it, they would be transferred to the other library branches, but there is no, um, no stacks, for lack of a better word. Damon? I'm seeing um, a hand raised by Heather Norquist. Is that someone with the library? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's okay. the regional manager. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Walter, will you please promote Heather Norquist? Good morning, Heather. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I can talk about some of the programs that we would like to offer at the Live Oak Annex. Um, we, one of the problems at the Live Oak Library branch is parking. It's very limited because of the site. And we have some very popular programs that are very well attended, but there, when people, so many people come that there's nowhere for them to park. So um, this annex gives us an opportunity to invite huge numbers. For example, our toddler time sometimes gets up to 70 people attending, and that's a noisy program with a lot of movement and, <laughs> and action. It would be great to offer that at the Annex. We also, during the summer, offer performers such as <clears throat> bubble magic or magic shows or puppet shows, and we can get around 100 people attending. And this is a space because we'll be partnering with <clears throat> Parks and Rec, we'll have through the MOU agreement, we'll have access to that big community room that can fit all those people and we'll have all that parking. Also being close to Shoreline Middle School and the Boys and Girls Club, it's <clears throat> transportation is something that, that is a challenge for, for children and middle schoolers um, to get to a library after school, but they can just, it'll be right next door to Shoreline. Boys and Girls Clubs, so we can offer more after school programs that it will be easier for them to attend. Um, we could offer craft programs. Okay, let's make it uh, Friday then. Walk in space and in the okay, meeting. Yeah, we, have, um, we offer homework help in those quiet study rooms. Right now, we have to take over the teen room for any kind of program where people are talking or making noise. So that, that um, makes the books in the teen room not accessible to teens. So those are some of the programs that we're hoping to offer. Thank you. Uh, Chair, please, could I speak, please? Uh, yes, Commissioner Shea, there it is. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that we got those further explanations. I think many of us are familiar with the uh, improvements at the Capitola Library and the proposed improvements at the Aptos Library, all due to the, the, the new funding that's available. And um, in both of those libraries that I'm familiar with, there is a lot of <laughs> more group rooms, more community <laughs> areas for facilitation, um, rather than tr the traditional checking out a book. Um, and there's also in those two proposed improvements or finished improvements at Capitola, a lot of indoor outdoor kind of uh, facilitation of uh, group activities and, and using outdoor spaces better. So that's what I see this at, at first, I, the, I think it's the word annex that I just, it's hard for me. I'm not quite sure what that means, but now I understand it's an expansion of with uh, a facility <laughs> different types of activities uh, that will be available for live oak residents. Is that a correct interpretation? Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Sheridan, did you have further questions? Uh, just a comment and uh, thank you. That really helped clarify for both of several of the architect and um, the library representative. It's wonderful to think that you could have better access and include programs. I don't know how many people would be able to fit into a room, but when you have a community room like that and toddlers and Loud voices, that sounds wonderful. So, thank you. Can I make a comment? Yes. 
Um, I'm not sure if this is going to the board or not, but if it does go to the board, may I suggest that you put some of this explanation of what's going to happen there into the, uh, into whatever you give the supervisors, because that's the first question everybody asked. And I think we all think these are good and appropriate uses, but it was sincerely missing from the report. Maybe obvious to you, but it wasn't to us. Those sound like great uses to me too. I totally agree. And this is a good place to do it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it will go to the Board of Supervisors once the um, we have permits in hand and for uh, so it's approval of the design and approval of the bid. Um, so I will make sure that there is um, a good summary and explanation for the project. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I will open the public hearing. Ms. Drake, do we have uh, participants on the line? We do. Um, Walter, if you have a uh, timer, you can set that for three minutes. And we will start with um, Jean Brocklebank. Uh, good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, this is Michael Lewis. Um, well, I am using this the same computer that Jean is. I'll be speaking first, and then Jean will follow with her comment afterwards. Okay, we, good morning. Okay. Uh, my concern uh, for this permit process has to do with the phase two section of this, which was not mentioned in Rand Randall's presentation and which appears only superficially in the planning documents that you have before you. Phase two is the so-called child care facility to be built on the southern border of the existing building. Uh, however, it is much more than just a box that will have child care in it. It also includes the patio area that exists on the south side of the building today which has a large wall around it that separates it from the riparian uh, buffer zone. Uh, unfortunately, the plans for phase two, as shown in the plans today, call for the removal of that separation from the buffer zone. And this makes this the most environmentally uh, impactful part of this project because it opens up that uh, riparian buffer zone to all the activity that will go on in this patio area, including, uh, as commission, Commissioner Sheridan suggested, an increased lighting into that riparian zone. Um, the uh, patio area will be extended farther, closer to the riparian zone as it is now. Uh, the wall will be removed and there will be uh, extensive modification of the landscaping that it currently exists on that, that will affect both the, uh, the noise and light coming from that patio area. Um, if you'll notice on um, page 10 of the permit application under section operational conditions, um, it says that the, the review of this phase two may be processed initially as a building permit this is more ministerially as a building permit. This is more than adding a building to the project. It includes increased intrusion into the riparian buffer zone and removal of that wall, which will increase the intensity of activity that affects the buffer zone. So I'm, I'm really concerned that this part of phase two be addressed now and not be a ministerial decision. That means a decision that will be taken without public input uh, when the, the plans for this phase two are completed. I also should let you know with regard to the previous discussion that there will be no library staff in this facility except when there are activities going on. The facility will be staffed by parks, by a park person, a park employee, 30 seconds and not by staff. So this makes it more not not a library facility. It's just a an extension of the meeting area of the um, the existing parks facilities. And it uh, it's very different than what has been described. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, Jean, would Jean like to go ahead and start making a comment? At this time, 
Okay, hi, Jean Brocklebank. I'm a 33 year Live Oak resident. My main concern, beside the fact that there will be no books, no bookshelves, and no librarians at the Live Oak Library Annex, <laughs> unless there's programming, uh, my main concern is also the phase two expanded patio area. Wildlife biologists already know that night lighting disturbs circadian rhythms of all species. This disturbance is a stress factor affecting the well being of species, including our own. Also, if we learned anything during the COVID pandemic shutdown, it is that wildlife benefited from the reduction of noise in the environment. Indeed, we all remarked upon the relief from traffic noise ourselves. Scientists globally, nationally, and even here at UC Santa Cruz are now providing data that shows that great beneficial response of the lack of noise and just basically the cacophony of modern uh, urban civilization. On So um, my thought is, we can have an expanded patio area at Simpkins as proposed and still protect riparian wildlife habitat. All we have to do is make the design of this project reflect that care. The county general plan acknowledges the intrinsic value of wildlife habitat. The Coastal Commission will no doubt look at this also. The existing aesthetically pleasing patio curved wall that now separates the riparian buffer zone from human noise, disturbance, and building lighting currently acts as a buffer, this wall, currently acts as a buffer between wildlife habitat of the riparian buffer zone, which is itself a buffer to an extension of riparian habitat. Nighttime patio lighting should be minimized so as not to intrude into the riparian buffer or beyond. And that wall is a good way to minimize that, dis that light disturbance. Therefore, I ask your commission to amend the conditions of approval of this project application, which we see in the staff report. 30 seconds. Uh, amend the conditions of approval of this project application rather than approve the application as provided by requiring that the phase two expanded outdoor patio area be redesigned to retain the existing wall that separates it from the riparian buffer zone rather than demolish it as planned and also will be required to incorporate the same kind of wall in the expanded patio area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, Chair, I'm gonna go back to our callers. <clears throat> I do have a comment, um, which I will read that was emailed to me just now from Becky Steinbrunner, but I wanted to check and see if we had any additional callers on the line first. So I wanted to remind folks who may be calling in via telephone to press star nine on your phone to make yourself known if you wish to make a comment on this item, the library annex project. <clears throat> and I'm not seeing any. So chair, um, if you're amenable, I have an emailed comment from Becky Steinbrunner. She has requested that I read it into the record. Certainly, Ms. Strick, okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, Becky Steinbrunner says, I am opposed, oops, pardon me. Uh, Becky Steinbrunner says, I'm opposed to the design because it is not harmonious with the Simpkin Center design. There is a large and modern library located only one mile away on Portola Drive, the Live Oak Library and there has been no finding providing the need for this library annex, and that this project would be better fit with the existing Boys and Girls Club adjacent. Why can't the library system just use the existing large community room in the Simpkins Center for programs that bring large crowds? Heather Norquist just said there's insufficient parking at the library 
how can there be no impact on the Simpkins Swim Center used parking as stated in the project staff report? This makes no sense. The construction would cause great potential harm to Simpkins Swim Center traffic in an area with many young children. Due to the 990 truck trips required to cut for cut and fill activity and significant dust, noise, and vibration impacts. Tree replacement will not equal the number of trees replaced. The construction would remove 11 trees, but only eight would be replaced. This is not in keeping with the intent and purpose of Santa Cruz County Code 1634-010-A, stating that the Board of Supervisors, Supervisors recognize trees are a valuable resource and necessary for public health, safety, and general we welfare. The county has already removed over 100 trees in the county for the installation of the parking lot solar panels, and many were, <clears throat> and many were removed from the Simpkins Swim Center but never replaced. This project results in a further diminished tree population and cooling effect in the overall area. <clears throat> this project would remove the circular, circular driveway area that I have many times seen elderly patients of the swim center use for drop off by paratransit in private vehicles, not only for swimming, but also for attendance of community meetings in the Simpkins Swim Center Parks and Rec building. This project would require those people to be dropped off at some distance because the circular driveway would be eliminated. The main entrance to the Simpkins Center which is near the existing handicapped parking areas is usually closed during evening public meetings in the community rooms. <clears throat> Finally, this overflow area for the existing Live Oak Library should be addressed to the existing, should be added to the existing Live, Live Oak Library, not to the Simpkins Swim Center. It has been stated in staff reports to the Board of Supervisors that there may not even be library staff at this annex and there may not be books available unless requests are made. This is not a library. It should not be funded by Measure 5 monies. This belongs at the existing Live Oak Library or at the adjacent Boys and Girls Club. I regret that I cannot stay to comment this morning and that I was only given two minutes during public comment rather than three minutes for comment on this item and was cut off mid-sentence. And that concludes Becky's comments. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And I will go back to the list of attendees one more time. Okay. And I am not seeing any additional hands raised, Chair. Okay. If there are no more participants uh, that want to address this issue, then I'll bring it back to the commission and we'll close the public hearing. And bring this back to the commission. Well, I have comments. Okay. Commissioner right. Sheridan. Well, I agree with uh, Jean and Michael. Unfortunately, being a late, late coming to the meeting, I could not review in detail what I would have liked to. Um, I apologize. Uh, I think my initial question, I didn't realize the back childcare area was going to have that kind of impact. And that is a huge concern for me. So um, I'd like to understand more about that project. I don't know if that could be separated. Uh, it's probably part of the same funding, but if it was able to be a separate discussion, and mitigation regarding the wall and its relationship to the riparian, I think is a critical factor. Um, setback, setback, I'm not sure about the setback, but the wall would have a huge impact of affecting light and uh, any other kind of impact on the riparian. So that would be an important question. Um, as far as the trees, I think, Becky is bringing up an important point about replacement. Uh, there probably is room for adding on the the one to one on the tree replacement. And um, I am also a little bit confused about the use of the annex for what is the percentage of time that it would be open 
hours in a day? Is there actually funding for staff? Is, is this something that's going to be shared by parks? That seemed really confusing. So I, I like, uh, just to close, I, I do think that the, um, uh, the proposal made by um, earlier by Jean Brocklebank about the uh, a possibility of maintaining that wall made sense to me. So if you'd like to comment on any of that, that would be helpful for the... Okay, just one moment, uh, Commissioner Sher Sheridan. Commissioner Hol Holbert, yes. do you have it? Yes, I had a suggestion because I agree that I think we need to look at the, the area where the child care um, is the child care center is proposed and I think we could just change the uh, operational conditions on, on number one just to um, say the review of the design and construction of the child care area proposed in the second phase of the project shall return to the planning commission for approval and redesign to protect the riparian area. I don't agree that it should just be a, mysteri a st ministerial uh, approval. I think it does need some more work. Okay, so you would you would favor then? Um, I'm okay with the rest. Of, I'm okay with the rest of it, but I think we need to stop and look at that again. Okay, separating phase two. Yeah. Yes. Okay, to come back to this commission. Yes, I I would support um, that language, and I think it makes sense to break it up that way. Okay, are there any other questions? And then I'll ask the uh, representatives to comment on on your your comments also, Commissioner Shepard. I mean, Sheridan. Um, Chair? I, yes. I was a mention made in a previous public, con I believe it was Ms. Steinbrunner, that the circular driveway is being eliminated. And I just yes. wanna clarify it doesn't look like that on the plans to me. Is that correct? I what thought I read it. What is happening to the circular driveway, the existing? The circular driveway is proposed for removal and replacement with the patio area. So there's gonna be no circular driveway to drop people on or off? That's correct. It appears they're proposing a vehicle drop off um, in a pocket that is uh, adjacent to the oak tree that was in the center of the circle. Uh, you can see this on sheet A2.01, probably most clearly, uh, in terms of the overview of the site. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to confirm, yeah, there will still be a drop off area um, as mentioned by Randall, and then we're retaining all of the uh, ADA parking to the west of the main entry. Okay. How, how far away is that? The current ADA parking, as I recall, was just before the circular driveway on the west side, but I can't remember the, um, I hope I didn't speak out of turn. No, go ahead. No, no change is proposed to the, the location or number of accessible parking spaces for the plant. Yeah, okay. And does any representative want to address the idea of separating phase two to be another application later? I, if, I, if I may, um, so currently, um, the work for phase one is funded. Um, I, I do want to note though that uh, the area for phase two, there was no intent to um, um, impose in, or uh, go into the uh, current riparian zone. We wouldn't be able to do that. And there, there's nothing designed to remove the existing wall currently. I, I do want to state that. Um, but going, going back, I mean, the main focus for us right now, I mean, this is a, a larger project with both phases, but um, only phase one has been designed in detail. So I don't know if Leo, you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I would just reemphasize that, you know, what's shown on phase two is essentially diagrammatic. It, the childcare 
function hasn't really been defined. We don't really understand. We haven't figured out or no one's figured out what sort of access, what sort of security would be required, whether or not the wall remains, it's transformed, it's adjusted. I think all of those questions are, I mean, I agree that they should be addressed. There shouldn't be easy access into the riparian zone. The intention is not to extend the boundaries of the site beyond their current boundary, but we, we suppose that there will likely be some reconfiguration needed once that space is designed and the requirements are defined, but we haven't done any of that work yet. So it's, it's diagrammatic only at this stage. So one of the things we could do, um, the, the main purpose of the master site plan or even amendment to a master site plan as this project is, is to get a conceptual approval. We certainly could have this item come back to your commission for further review. Um, alternatively, what we could do, it seems like folks are in agreement that the wall that is there now is effective and extending the wall along any expansion of the patio area would also be equally effective. It would stay out of the riparian buffer zone. So you'd have the wall uh, for noise and light, and then you'd have the riparian buffer area, both as protections. We could um, instead change the review of the design and construction of the childcare area to a level four review which means it is still um, a review that the public can comment on and potentially appeal to a higher body if they'd like. And we could also add a condition that requires them under con con um, Roman numeral uh, 4A1A that uh, for that facility or that, that phase that we retain the existing patio wall and extend the wall along the expanded patio area. Um, I don't know if the exact shape of the wall with the two wings on it is what uh, would work with the child care area, but uh, we could we could fine tune that language to say to maintain a patio wall that 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 uh, that establishes an effective barrier between the riparian area and the patio. I would recommend keeping it flexible just because there are so many unknowns at the point and if the goal is to you know not infringe further and maintain a wall of equal or greater um, separation as a boundary, I, I would recommend allowing that, um, so making perhaps, sure that there's enough flexibility to see what's needed when parks. Yeah. Sort of perhaps the correct term would be to retain or replace the existing patio wall and extend the wall along any expanded patio area. Yeah, um, may I comment? Yes, go ahead. Um, I would, uh, I think the suggestion of it not being ministerial and having it coming back to the planning commission is important and I would not recommend making a suggestion of expanding the wall because that becomes an entire brand new environmental impact so um, I think the whole thing needs to come back for review but if it's not ministerial then you can have the opportunity to have public input however it's decided I don't think that needs to be figured out right now, it just needs to be able to be commented on and the planning commission needs to have an opportunity for that again. Okay, and Commissioner Holbert. I agree with that. I just wanna make sure that we, somebody gets to see it again and it's not just good intentions. I think um, good intentions often go astray. So I need to be, uh, we need to keep track of it. Okay. Um, are we to the stage where someone can make a motion on this? Well, we, we didn't get a comment on the tree replacement, why that was not a one-to-one. -one. Oh. Mm -hmm. Would one of you like to comment on why there are more trees removed than replaced? I would defer to the design team on that decision. Um, I do not have an answer at this exact moment, so I would have to go back and look at it. I know that we um, involved an arborist at the early phases of figuring out which trees would be removed, and some of the trees on site did have some health issues, and I would have to find out in more detail exactly how those decisions would be made. I don't want to speak without having the information at hand. Sorry, Damon. <laughs> Perhaps okay, but that could be part of the um, the proposal is that uh, there's plenty of room there, even in the park next door, to probably have native uh, a native tree fill in somewhere on a one to one. I think that should be. I think that's part of the county 
requirement, isn't it? I, I don't know. I... So the trees on the site are not considered significant trees in the coastal zone. Uh, which would require a replacement ratio to be determined by environmental planning staff. One to one would be a common method. Uh, so the protections for those trees would be under our design review ordinance. Um, and generally those are just trees that are six inches in diameter or greater. Um, in this case, since a lot of that area is being converted to hardscape for plaza type uses, um, my, my guess is that the idea with the design would be to not have so many canopy trees, be better to shade the parking lot. Um, another commenter said that some trees were lost in other improvements on the site. So um, I don't know if there are other locations on the site where trees could go that wouldn't interfere with the solar panels or the plaza um, plant. Right, the, uh, if I could comment again, that parking lot definitely lacks shade. I, I don't know if there's trees that could be added in that area, but it'd be great because there's a lot of concrete there. And um, I think that's a worthwhile um, thing to follow up on whenever there's concrete or space to plant a tree. And especially in this case, one-to-one. -one. So I, I'm gonna clarify what, thank you for those, that, that input. I, I, I think that one point I do wanna say is that 11 trees are proposed for removal and eight trees are proposed to be planted. So we're actually talking about three trees here. Okay. And some of them are small, quite small already, the ones that are being removed. Okay, well, I think whenever we can plant trees, it's important. Would there be any possibility of planting trees in the parking lot? You know, in, in squares that are blocked off for trees? It, if I if I may comment, um, maybe a little bit difficult uh, due to the solar panels um, that have been the, been installed in the parking lot. Um, there is an opportunity potentially, though, and we yeah, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn, but I believe we we talked about to the um, I want to say the north side uh, closer to the proposed rail trail. There may be an opportunity there um, for additional trees to be planted. And we had talked about that with um, the landscape architect earlier. Is it, is, does that sound correct? Hmm. Yeah, there's 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 some landscape space sort of where the existing monument sign is as you come into the parking lot. And I think, you know, something that's come up is putting more actual landscaping in that area. And again, it's not within the scope of this, pr this particular project right now, but it's, certainly area that is available and that's been identified as would be nice to put more planting in there for sure. Uh, I'd like to comment. Yes, Commissioner Shepard. Well, I'd like to have Commissioner Holbert um, make her suggested motion, if that's what's gonna be again, about separating these projects. I certainly think we don't want to do anything uh, on tap as we're discussing anything. I think it should come back and be available for public comment. And I think the staff agrees that these concerns that were expressed are valid and can be accommodated. So let's just separate them. I see no reason not to suggest that as part of this project, trees that, that they, we give direction that trees in the parking lot be looked into. After all, when commercial supermarkets and shopping centers redo their sites, they always put in trees and parking. So it's obviously not complicated or too expensive to do it or else all those commercial entities wouldn't be doing it and they seem to be required to in every case. So I think let's give a little more force to that direction. Um, Chair I, if, if I may add um, or comment, um, <clears throat> just, just so it's known a lot of times uh, when you add trees to parking lots, it's when the new parking lots and to modify an existing parking lot uh, for trees is, is more difficult. I just wanted to add that. Um, and, and if I may, I, I have another comment um, as well, and hopefully this is the right time. Um, the, the idea of separating the conditions for the, the wall adjacent to the riparian zone, I just, I just wanna reiterate that it's just no design has occurred yet for that and that any conditions, additional conditions uh, put on that, that phase two work should be uh, very flexible. Um, I just I just wanna note that while it is a, uh, a riparian zone and needs to be preserved, there is uh, 
uh, land adjacent to the riparian zone that is part of parks land and that currently that area is actually um, being utilized as an encampment, a homeless encampment. So it's, um, I think maximum flexibility there, uh, any additional conditions that uh, is, is what we're requesting. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Uh, Chair Lazenby. Yes. If I may, um, I'm seeing that the um, parks director, Jeff Gaffney, is raising his hand as an attendee. And I think um, the commission may wish to hear from him. Um, so shall I go ahead and ask that he be promoted to speak? Uh, yes, go ahead. We, even though we've closed the public hearing, but this would He's be part important. of the project team, <clears throat> I would say. Right. Okay. Um, Jeff, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so I was, uh, unfortunately, I was in another meeting and wasn't able to hear all of the comments, but I did just want to make sure if we're going to have a library project start to make determinations about what's done on the parkland that we were involved in that decision making. So it sounded like um, a library project that we've worked collaboratively with was now making some determinations about what's happening on a park land. So that was my concern. Um, so happy to, to entertain any questions or thoughts. Um, I think that there's been um, a, plenty of discussion on this already. And um, I wanted to say that um, we are more than happy to try to um, satisfy any concerns that are brought forward. And I know it sounded like some of this was about a wall uh, behind the community room and um, some trees that we were concerned about. We definitely have the ability on some of our parkland back here that had a recent fire on it, as well as the homeless encampment that we can definitely do some and should do some tree planting back there. Um, and additionally, we would never do anything to impact the riparian area. If anything, I think it would be important to embrace that riparian area in a very positive way. So um, I didn't know that the project was gonna be split apart. So I just wanted to jump in and see if that was something that needed further discussion. Thank you. Commissioner Holbert. I don't want to overcomplicate this in terms of trying to protect the uh, uh, riparian um, area. So it, I don't even know if we need to, if, if it's considered splitting it apart, but I don't think that that part of um, that any construction or anything should go ahead on um, that building unless it returns to the planning commission or zoning administrator or, or whoever so that the public has uh, ability to at least know what's going on and comment on it and make sure that it's happening. So whatever the simplest way to do that is the way that I would like to, to do it. And I don't know whether it just means changing the operational conditions. I am concerned that uh, when we talk about it, it's sort of like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what we're going to do. It's all just theoretical at this stage. That's what concerns me. So I just want to make sure that um, we do protect that area. And I would look to staff to come up with some language there. I guess I would just, I wanted to share the fact that the homeless encampment was able to be developed back there was partly because the wall is there. And so if we're able to embrace the riparian area and protect it more visibly, I think that was part of the concern for us. And so you're right, um, it is not necessarily clearly outlined what we would do, but um, definitely we want to improve the riparian corridor and protect it and do a better job of that. So that's part of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so I, I, I just wanted, I don't want to overly discuss, I don't want to discuss this too much, but um, I feel like the, the intentions that we've spent the last couple of years working on here are being sort of misconstrued and also that we we're now sharing uh, splitting the project apart concerns me i, I i'm going to defer to damon and he, he's going to tell me whether or not this makes sense or not well i i don't you know i don't i yes. don't see that this is a, i think we're it's kind of you're overblowing you know what's 
what I'm asking for here. It is, okay. It's just because there are no plans and that's been, people have testified, we don't really know what we're gonna do. We don't really know what the design is. We really don't know about the wall. We think we're gonna keep the wall. Let's have some certainty before we move ahead with this project. That's all I'm asking. It's not, it's not trying to interfere in parks business or anything like that. Just let's do it right. Shafer Freitas, Commissioner. Um, I would support a motion made by either Commissioner Holbert or Commissioner Sheridan, um, since it's in your district, I believe, um, supporting um, having it come back to the Planning Commission rather than a ministerial changing operational condition A1 so that it comes back. That's what I understood, Commissioner Holbert, that you're suggesting. Yes. So I just wanted to say I would support if a motion was made in that direction. Would that be a motion for the entire matter to come back? No, just for condition on page 10, 10. condition A1, instead no. of coming back ministerially, that it come back to the planning commission, which I assume would be a public hearing. Yes. And so it would be just for that section of the project. Yeah, I'd be happy to make that motion. I believe that our planner had discussed what actual level it would be coming back as. So I don't, if it's not ministerial and you want to have a public hearing, what would that be? Level six. Staff would need to explain that possibly. If, if I may, um, the, the, it sounds like the idea of it being under these uh, master site plan approvals, oftentimes if there is acceptance that things could move forward and there weren't the concerns that have been raised, we would review those as either a ministerial building permit, sounds like that is not acceptable, or a level four, which would be um, an administrative review with public notice. It does not sound like that is what the commission is asking for. So staff recommends uh, with the request made by Holbert and others, um, that the operational condition Roman numeral 4A1, uh, beginning on page 10, uh, be modified to delete the portion that says may be processed ministerially as a building permit and replace that language with shall return to the planning commission for review of the design. Great. Yeah, that, can we put that, in? I'm not well practiced at this, but that sounds appropriate if somebody wanted to try to reword that. Well, um, why can't we just adopt his language? It's good. You want to read it out again and we'll make it into a motion? Certainly. I'll just read the whole condition, mm -hmm. Roman numeral A1. Uh, it would read the review of the design and construction of the child care area proposed in the second phase of the project shall return to the planning commission for review of the design. And then it goes on to say about the architectural style and character, but that doesn't seem to be of a concern. Yeah, and it, and it and it uses the language would not be ministerial. It deletes that. That's yeah. struck. Right. And replaced by shall return to the planning commission for review of the design yeah. or well, the that, project design. Yeah, that part works for me. I would second that as a motion. Okay. All in favor of the could, motion. Could we, I'd like to just, um, would it be okay with the maker of the motion? Did the motion be to determine that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approve application 201354 based on the attached findings with the revision of operation condition A1 as, as described by staff. Good. <laughs> okay. Would that be acceptable? Would we want to make Commissioner Sheridan. Yeah. Uh, can we read that one more time, please? <laughs> okay. Um, that we determine that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act. This is under staff recommendations, page three. And approval of application number 201354 based on the attached findings and conditions except that operating condition A-A.1 -A will be revised so that it, it's not a ministerial, but it will be brought back to the planning commission. 
Um, I'm confused why the language would say would not have an environmental review because all projects have to be environmentally reviewed, don't they, through county uh, general plan? They have to meet general plan and they need, uh, I don't know, is that normal to put that in there that they wouldn't have an environmental review? Correct. The commission is tasked with accepting the determination that this proposal is exempt from further review under the Environmental Quality Act. That doesn't mean it was not reviewed, looked at, or considered under those provisions. It's just determined to be exempt from further review. Ah, correct. And the um, so if you were to expand, if you were to expand the wall, how does that? could be an environmental impact, how, how, does, how is that managed? So the way this is lining up now with a return to the planning commission, it's essentially getting rid of the phasing for the project. It's maybe approving it in concept for that second phase, but basically the phase two project will be a whole nother level six application, planning commission review, public hearing, and we'll look at that for environmental impacts. Okay. My assumption is that the placement of the wall, if it's done in a similar manner to as it's been done, previously would not trigger further environmental review would likely be exempt as well, but we would not make that determination until plans were before us, which is, it sounds like what your commission would like to see. That's correct. Um, if any other commissioners want to weigh in on that to help, I'm a little bit not up to speed on how it's done. So if any other commissioners want to weigh in. I think, I think, I think it's uh, the way to go. Okay. Thank you. I'm good. Can we call the question? Mm -hmm. okay. So do we have a do we have a second, Chair? I have the motion made by Commissioner Sheridan. Second. Thank you. Call the question. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Or raise Aye. your hand. Uh -huh. You can't see me, so I'm raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the motion carries and the, um, so this would be exempt from further, we're, we're keeping that language, right? Further CEQA review? Yeah. Correct. Yep. yep, we've called the question on the motion as proposed. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So that takes care of item number eight on the agenda. Thank you, by the way, for letting me jump in. I appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And thank you everyone who participated in this. We always need uh, the public's input as well before we make decisions on these. So on item number nine, do we have a planning director's and, uh, report? Chairman, can we take a break? It's 11.13. Well, we only have three items. Yeah. Don't have okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just the three. Okay. Let's keep following along. Yeah. Planning director's report. Um, Chair, I see that Paya Levine uh, has her hand raised. So, um, Walter, can you please uh, promote Paya? Good morning, Paya. Good morning. Mm. Is she muted? I it appears she dropped out here. Paya, can you hear us? Oh, she's muted. You're muted. Thank you. Good morning. I just wanted to respond to the uh, to the item. There's no specific planning director's report today. I just wanted the commissioners to know that um, I've been present sitting in for Kathy during the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. And a report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Um, yes, Chair, we, um, the next uh, scheduled uh, meeting date is July 28th and we do not have any items. Uh, scheduled for that hearing. So it appears we'll be canceling that uh, that hearing date. Um, 
So the next scheduled uh, hearing would be August 11th. And so far we do not have reservations for that um, hearing date, but I will keep you posted as to whether or not we will um, hold a meeting on that date. So July 28th will be canceled. Um, and I just wanted to let the Planning Commission know that we are working on bringing uh, live um, in-person Planning Commission hearings back to the board chambers. Um, we hope to um, retain the call-in, the phone-in component for the public. Um, so Michael Lamb and I will be working with our um, IT department to um, put together a hybrid type meeting uh, model. Um, and we're shooting for September of this year for bringing the Planning Commission back to the chambers, but I will definitely be sending some emails to the planning commissioners to um, keep uh, the commission abreast of our plans and field any concerns and make adjustments as necessary. I just wanted to let you know, it looks like the board is coming back to the chambers and in-person meetings in um, August, as I understand it. And that is, that is all from the planning department. Okay, thank you. And county council's report. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I wanted to comment on a couple things that I had witnessed this morning and um, just to clarify a couple things. I think the Chair had asked me right before the meeting about the consent item and I think there was some confusion over how that proceeded this morning. So I think in the future, what we'll do is just once we come up to the consent item on the agenda, we will have a, a roll call vote on that item. Uh, I sent the chair a follow-up email on this. I don't think it was received in time, um, but just to avoid any confusion in the future, we'll do a um, a vote on the consent item. And, you know, had there been any public comment on that consent item, we may have had to rescind the motion and actually um, re-vote, uh, but there were no public comments on that consent item, so all went well. Um, and then the other comment that I had was, um, since we're doing this virtually, and I don't know how much longer we're going to be doing these meetings virtually, uh, it always helps to have a roll call vote rather than a, a voice or hand raised vote. Just for a, um, just for the record, it's it's a lot easier to distinguish who's voting on what and who's making the motion. So that is all I have, and I uh, wish you a very good week. Thanks. Thank you too. So that concludes our meeting. And um, I want to uh, express appreciation for all the IT people who've helped out in this. And just as we're almost getting used to this, I guess we're going to go back to in person. <laughs> but I will call the meeting, <laughs> I will call the meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.